So we're starting today. We're going to look at the gas laws. And with gas laws, there are a couple of things that we need to understand. One of them is just kind of a, a base definition of pressure. Now we talked about pressure before. Pressure is just the amount of force that is being exerted by the molecules on its container. And we tied that directly to the idea of molecular collisions. The more collisions that we have, the more pressure is going to be exerted. Now, atmospheric pressure is measured using a barometer. A barometer basically looks at the um, relationship between two forces, the force of gravity pushing the mercury down on the column versus the pressure of the atmosphere pushing down on the pool of mercury, which causes the mercury to go up the column. Where it stops, that is our equilibrium point. That's where we can measure the actual pressure by just simply measuring how much the mercury went up the tube. So in the simplest sense, that is how we can measure atmospheric pressure. Now, in terms of units for pressure, there are many, many, many units of pressure. But I'll tell you the ones that we focus on the most often. Most often, we focus on the atmosphere of pressure. We focus on the millimeter of mercury, which is the same thing as the tor. And occasionally, occasionally we'll talk about things in terms of bars but not very often for those of you that are physics and engineering um you'll hear a lot about pascals pascals and kilopascals the reason for that is those are the um those are the metric units and those units are what are woven into um your uh, force units like uh, newtons and uh, joules uh, for energy. So that's where they tend to kind of put their stock. The reason we don't focus on them so much is because a pascal of pressure is very, very small. Right now, you are sitting in a one atmosphere pressure environment. That is the pressure that is being exerted on you by the gases around you. Now, we're slightly above sea level. And by slightly, I mean in the tens of feet above sea level. So yes, we're probably just that much below one atmosphere of pressure, but not much. In Pascals, that's 101,325. So one atmosphere of pressure is over 101,000 pascals. As you might expect, the numbers kind of get ridiculous after a while. And that's why we generally avoid pascals and even kilopascals when we're trying to describe pressure. That's why we tend to focus more on atmospheres. Or if we don't have atmospheres available, we'll focus on the measurement units, the things that we can measure with a barometer measured with a manometer because it's literally putting a ruler up in something and measuring it instead of relying on sensors and other kinds of electronic devices. So as we're starting to think about the relationships between gas molecules and these gas parameters, I'm going to introduce a couple of discussion questions for you. Here's the first one. If we have a fixed amount of gas at a constant temperature, what would the relationship between the pressure of that gas and its volume be?
Now, in terms of answers to this question, there are really three. There could be a direct relationship between the two. If one goes up, the other one goes up as well. There could be an inverse relationship. One goes up, the other one goes down. Or there can be no relationship. Anybody else? All right, the relationship here is inverse. The relationship here is inverse. We're talking about something called Boyle's Law. Boyle's Law states that the volume of a gas is inversely related to its pressure. If I compress a gas, and push it into a smaller volume, the pressure is gonna go up accordingly. Main reason why, I'm forcing those gas molecules closer to each other, and so they're gonna hit each other more. More collisions means more pressure. Now, there is a relationship here. When we see inverse relationships, we should note that those inverse relationships are always going to be denoted mathematically as that. That alpha symbol there, the fish looking symbol, that indicates the relationship. So there is a relationship between pressure and one over the volume, the inverse of the volume. Mathematically speaking, in equation form, it looks like this. The pressure times the volume at one set of conditions is equal to the pressure times the volume at a second set of conditions. That's Boyle's law. Let's take a look at an example mathematically. We have a balloon that is inflated with five liters of helium. The atmospheric pressure is one atmosphere. It goes to an altitude of 1,600 meters, just a bit short of a, a mile. And the pressure there is 18.83 atmospheres. What is the volume at the higher altitude if the temperature does not change? So we're talking about constant temperature. And since all of the gas is in a balloon, a fixed amount of gas, this is a Boyle's Law application. My initial pressure was one atmosphere. My initial volume was five liters. My second pressure is 0.83 atmospheres. And I'm trying to find its new volume. Algebraically, I need to get V2 by itself. So I'm gonna divide both sides by 0.83 atmospheres. That will cancel out the 0.83, to cancel out the atmospheres. Wall 
one times five divided by 0.83 to three significant figures would be 6.02 liters. With these kinds of problems where we have relatively simple relationships between the two, you can always ask yourself the logical question, does this answer make sense? Does it fit with the qualitative observation that we know? Meaning, we see that the pressure has gone down. Since the relationship is inverse, we would expect that the volume would go up. Did the volume go up? Yes, it went from five to six. We can see that there is sense in the answer that we have. All right, any questions with this particular example? All right, let's do another discussion kind of question here. This time we are holding pressure constant with a fixed amount of gas. We want to know the relationship between the temperature and its volume. Again, three possible answers. It's either a direct relationship, they both rise and fall in the same way. It's an inverse relationship where they flip over or they're not related at all. Couple more seconds, get your answers in, please. All right, most of you chimed in with the correct answer. The correct answer is that it is a direct relationship. The direct relationship here is something called Charles' Law. Charles' Law tells us that if we have a constant pressure and a fixed amount of gas, we will see a direct relationship between the temperature, the absolute temperature in Kelvin, and the volume of the gas. Easy way to look at this is with an experiment like this one. You can actually replicate this kind of an experiment at home with a balloon. 
Um, if you blow up a balloon at room temperature and then put it in the freezer, you'll see that the balloon will shrink down in the freezer because the polar temperature in there will cause the gases to contract. And then if you take that same balloon and put it over a pot of boiling water, it'll expand and actually get bigger. Look at the differences in the way that it's expressed. Notice that since it is a direct relationship, there is no one over component in that proportionality. And look at how the relationship is in the equation. With the indirect relationship, we multiply the factors. In the direct relationship, we divide them. All right. Different relationship to look at here. This time we are looking at the amounts of gas. So our fixed values here are pressure and temperature. This one should be the easiest. We're all on the right track. We've all blown up a balloon before. You blow up a balloon, you're putting air into the balloon. You're adding gas to it and the balloon expands. This one's pretty, this one's pretty straightforward. Now the relationship here is tied to a man called Amadeo Avogadro. You may have heard of him. He's the one that has the number that you guys like so much. But the relationship is gas volume and, and uh, amount of gas are directly related, directly proportional. Since they are directly proportional, we can put the two variables over each other, just like we did the volume and the temperature. Now, there is an important ramification to this Avogadro law. And it is this. If I have equal volumes of gas at the same temperature and pressure, they will have the same amount of moles. Or inversely, if I have equal moles at the same temperature and pressure, they'll take up the same volume. Either way you want to look at it. What that allows us to do is it allows us to set a standard. That standard is STP, standard temperature and pressure, 760 millimeters of mercury, which if we remember from the previous slide is one atmosphere, 273 Kelvin, which is zero degrees Celsius. That is standard temperature and pressure. At standard temperature and pressure, one mole of gas takes up 22.4 liters of space. Doesn't matter what the gas is. Kind of like a colligative property. The identity doesn't make a difference. The number of particles does. And if I have one mole of gas, I have Avogadro's number of those particles. So at that fixed temperature, at that fixed pressure, the volume ends up being fixed as well, 22.4 liters. So 
the question you might have been asking yourself is, my goodness, there are so many equations here. Do I have to memorize all of these relationships and their interactions with each other? And the answer to that question is no. It's not important to me that you know Boyle's law equates pressure and volume and its relationship to each other. It's not important to me that you know that Avogadro's law links together volume and the amount of gas. What is important is that you understand the relationships broadly and that you understand that we can change any of those parameters at any given time. So what's really important is what we call the combined gas law. The combined gas law takes those concepts and puts them together. And so we can see, using a little bit of highlighting here, we can see Boyle's law inside of the combined gas law. We can see Charles law inside of the combined gas law. We can see Avogadro's law inside of the combined gas law. They're all there. And since they're all equal to a constant, we could write the combined gas law in this more familiar form using the ones and twos to indicate different sets of conditions. Now this relationship here, PV over NT is equal to a constant, we'll come back to that. That gives us another gas law that's really super important called the ideal gas law. But what we can understand here just with these parameters is that chances are pretty good that unless a chemical reaction is taking place, our value of N is going to be fixed. We're going to have the balloon. We're going to have some sort of container where all of this gas is being stored. And so if that's the case, we can usually hold N constant, which gives us a simplified form that we know more collectively, this is the combined gas law. When people say the combined gas law, this is usually what they are referring to, not the one that has the ends in the denominator as well. Because again, usually when we are seeing conditions where pressure and volume and temperature are all changing, it's not very often that we would see that the amount of gas is also changing as well in the process. So let's take a look at an example. We've got a weather balloon. The weather balloon is released with a pressure of 798 millimeters of mercury inside. At that moment, the volume and the temperature are 131 liters and 20 degrees Celsius. What we wanna know is what is the volume of the balloon when it gets to a certain altitude where the pressure is now 235 millimeters of mercury and the temperature is now 50, negative 52 Celsius. Well, the combined gas law is what we're going to use. P1, V1 over T1 is equal to P2, V2 over T2. Before we start plugging anything into that equation, we want to make sure we do one really important thing. Temperatures for these gas laws because we are dealing with energy, we have to convert them to Kelvin. So that means that the 20 degrees Celsius 
plus 273 is going to be 293 Kelvin. 273 minus the 52 degrees is going to be 221 Kelvin. That's an important step. If we forget to do that step, in this particular case especially, we're going to end up getting a negative volume. And you're going to be sitting there going, how on earth did we get a negative volume? What does a negative volume even look like? It's a really common mistake. Or even worse yet, you have one where you have zero degrees as one of the conditions and you end up having to try to figure out how to divide by zero, even more fun. So don't forget about this Kelvin piece. So now that we have that, we've got 798 millimeters of mercury. Volume initially is 131 liters. Initial temperature, 293 Kelvin. Our second pressure is 235 millimeters of mercury. We are trying to find the second volume, so we're going to leave that as V2. Temperature 2 is 221 Kelvin. To get V2 by itself, we're going to need to multiply each side by 221 Kelvin over 235 millimeters of mercury. That will get the Kelvins to cancel and the millimeters of mercury to cancel. Two hundred twenty-one multiplied by seven hundred ninety-eight multiplied by one hundred thirty-one divided by two hundred thirty-five divided by two hundred ninety-three to three significant figures would be three hundred and thirty-six liters. Now, with gas law problems, like I said before, you have to ask yourself, does the value make sense? Here, you've got opposing kind of forces at play. You've got a massive decrease in pressure, which would tell you that the balloon's going to expand. But you also have a decrease in temperature, which would tell you that the balloon should contract. Which force ultimately wins? Well, here's where we start to look at the differences. A 72 degree drop is significant, but it's only maybe a quarter of the, of the temperature. A change in pressure in this case represents a 70% change in pressure. So we're talking about a 70% change in pressure versus a 25% change in temperature. That pressure change is much more significant. That's the force that ends up winning out. That's why we see this expansion here where it expands to almost triple the size. So generally speaking, if we have both of those forces at play, the temperature force is always going to lose because since we're on the Kelvin scale, the Kelvin scale is going to be a lot less noticeable in terms of the changes. Whereas the pressure scale or the volume scale is going to be a lot more significant most of the time. All right, any questions with this sample exercise?
All right, so let's move on to the ideal gas law then. With the ideal gas law, what we are talking about is, remember that combined gas law equation that we had, dV over nT is equal to a constant. Well, in the ideal gas law, what we have is a name for that constant. That constant's name is R, it is the universal gas constant. The universal gas constant carries a value of 0 0.08206 liter atmospheres per mole of Kelvin. And so if we have pressure in atmospheres, volume in liters, moles of the gas and Kelvin temperature, we can use this equation to figure things out. Now, this equation kind of presumes that we would only ever use atmospheres as our unit of pressure. As you know, that's not true. So while R can certainly equal this value, I'm going to put its unit here in fractional form. We have other forms of R that we can use based upon circumstances. The most common of those other circumstances would be for millimeters of mercury instead of atmospheres or more kind of commonly for Achilles, tors. instead. Now there are other ones as well. If, if we want to get into kilopascals, um, you know, there's a value for that as well. There's a value for R that is associated more with energy kinds of, con of, of calculations. If you go on to take Chem 106, you'll see that one a lot um, because we talk a lot about energy in that class. But primarily for our purposes, it's one of these three. And notice that it's really just one of these two because 62.36 is the same for both millimeters of mercury and tor. And that's because they are the same unit. They're the same unit. The millimeter of mercury is sometimes referred to as tor as an homage to Evangelista Torricelli who invented the barometer that measured the millimeters of mercury in the first place. Now, as I mentioned, there is another version, 8.314, for use with pascals and kilopascals. You're not going to see us use that unit much in this class. Again, for those of you that take Chem 106, kind of keep that one in the back of your head. When we do energy calculations involving joules, that's where you're going to find that 8.314 used more often. But for right now, not really our thing. So let's do a couple of practice problems with the ideal gas law. First, let's calculate the pressure of four moles of methane in a 12.3 liter container at 25 Celsius. So if our ideal gas law is this, PV is equal to NRT. We haven't been given an official unit for pressure. So technically we could use either value of R that we wanted to. For the sake of, of uh, simplicity here, let's do atmospheres. So 
pressure is equal, multiplied by 12.3 liters is equal to 4.0 moles times 0 0.08206 liter atmospheres per mole Kelvin times the temperature, 25 Celsius. Remember, we have to add 273 to that. So that would give us 298 Kelvin. To get pressure by itself, we would need to divide by those 12.3 liters. Now we can see why that universal gas constant has that funky combination of units that it does, because it's gonna cancel out everything. Moles, liters up, liters down, Kelvin up, Kelvin down. Everything cancels out other than the pressure unit atmospheres. Four times 0 0.08206 times 298 divided by 12.3 to two significant figures. If we only had two in the number of moles, it would be 8.0 atmospheres. So what we're seeing here in, in the gas laws is a very equation heavy algebra focused kind of calculation method. Because almost everything is tied together with equations of some kind. All we need is proper algebra skills to figure out what's missing. But we can't go beyond that. Our last example today, we'll do using the ideal gas law to figure out a molar mass. Now, with molar masses, we know that a molar mass is simply grams divided by moles. So we are told here initially, we've got that many grams, 0 0.281. What we need to figure out is the number of moles. So let's go ahead and write that down right now. We have 0 0.281 grams of the sample over some number of moles. Don't know it yet. But what we can do is since we have a volume and a temperature and a pressure, we know three of our four parameters. We can use the ideal gas law to figure out the four. PV is equal to nRT. The pressure is 754 core. The volume, 127 milliliters. We have to convert that to liters. So that'd be 0.127 liters. Got to divide by 1,000. N is what we're trying to find, the number of moles. R, since our value is tor, we need to use the 62.36 liters tor over moles Kelvin. Temperature, 98 degrees plus 273 is 371 Kelvin. To get moles by itself, we're going to have to divide both sides 
by the 62.36 liter pour per mole Kelvin and 371 Kelvin. When we do that, torque get canceled, liters get canceled, Kelvin get canceled. I have one over the reciprocal of moles, so I'm gonna have moles as the unit. 754 times 0.127 divided by 62.36 divided by 371 to three sig figs. 4.14 times 10 to the negative third moles. So that's what I'm gonna put back into my original equation. Which means my molar mass Three significant figures would be 67.9 grams per mole. So there we have just a, a, a simple application of how we can use the ideal gas law to go beyond just those very simple kinds of problems where we just manipulate and figure out the missing variable. On your way out, before you call this a weekend, don't forget to hit the confidence meter. Um, let me know how you're feeling. Once you do that, you're free to go. Have a great weekend. I'll see you Monday.